Hey there, and welcome to your video, your lecture on um, topics 2.3 through 2.5 in your textbook. These topics cover island biogeography, ecological tolerance, and natural disruptions of ecosystems. Now, some of the things I'm going to be covering don't seem like they fit. I will explain why they do. So um, let's just go ahead and get started. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, the very first question that you have um, in your island biogeography section, which is basically on pages 242 and 243, is the acronym HIPCO. Um, the reason I'm folding this into <clears throat> island biogeography is just um, based on how important it is to the national exam in terms of giving you a base to think of answers for a lot of FRQs. HIPCO stands for um, all of the ways. Uh, basically right here, biodiversity researchers summarize the most important direct causes of species extinctions and threats to ecosystem services. That's by ultimately human endeavors, and it is the acronym HIPCO, which stands for Habitat Destruction, um, uh, de Degradation, Fragmentation, that's all in there. So destruction is totally gone. <coughs> degradation is you are making it a poorer quality <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and fragmentation is breaking it up into smaller chunks. Let me get a drink of water. Hold on one second. <coughs> yes, I am in my bathroom, my master bath, if you're wondering. Um, and then fragmentation is where the um, island biogeography comes in. <coughs> um, that's, you know, as you make these things smaller, the amount of organisms, especially apex predators, that can live there also lessens. And remember also when you talk about things like the edge effect, the smaller the pieces of um, a habitat are, the more edge that you have as opposed to core, and the more likely you are to have stuff going extinct around the edges. <coughs> um, the I is invasive species, um, which we've already talked about a little bit. P is population growth, um, and that's human population growth, and then the increasing use of resources. Um, the next P is pollution, climate change, and then over-exploitation. Um, uh, I, on a quiz, am not going to ask you about this stuff, but this is an acronym that you probably, it, it's not even anything that you'll be quizzed on on the national exam or tested on, um, but it is a great place to start if you're ever asked for, um, uh, to give a way in which humans impact an environment. So you remember HIPCO, and that'll give you a place to start. Okay, um, what is the greatest threat to habitat loss. Um, uh, it's going to be, um, mm, I think I think I, I think I typed that wrong. It should be what is the greatest threat to, uh, to wild species is habitat loss. So whoops, kind of messed up that question. Um, so it's, it's, it, if you have to pick the one thing that impacts organisms the most, it's going to be that habitat, habitat loss um, degradation and fragmentation. And again, this is where island biogeography comes in because when you make these small chunks of land that are surrounded by uh, human uh, man-made barriers, that's when you can start having problems on that island <clears throat> um, in terms of, of reduced biodiversity. Um, <clears throat> uh, 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 which specific habitats are under the greatest threat currently? Um, you can see right here tropical areas um, and then uh, coastal wetlands and coral reefs. Um, you can divide those up and that tropical areas um, are, are generally, um, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, terrestrial. And then you have the um, coastal wetlands and coral reefs. Um, why coastal wetlands? Because people want to live there. Why coral reefs? Because they block um, ships from coming in to the main one so you know obviously let's blow them up um uh all right so anyway um why are island species especially vulnerable to ex extinction and this is where this is kind of tangential to um island biogeography it's right here many of them are found nowhere else on the earth you already know that that word is endemic and um why are they especially vulnerable to extinction they're specialists um and endemic, so that means that if their particular habitat that they're uh, very um, 
uh, adapted to goes away, and they go away as well, and they have that narrow range of tolerance. Um, let's see, what is a habitat island and how do they form? You can see right here. Um, roads, logging operations, crop fields, and urban developments divide forests and natural grasslands. So basically anything that a human installs that um, is, is big, doesn't provide a lot of cover, and is what's called a monoculture, it's just one thing, uh, like a cornfield is just corn, uh, really kind of inhibits organisms from moving from, from one place to the next. And so you can see right here, reduces tree cover, blocks animal migration routes. And remember animals migrate for a variety of reasons, but mostly it has to do with resources, food and water. Um, how do they form, again, human intervention? Uh, list three major ways that habitat fragmentation impacts uh, an animal species. So uh, it can divide uh, populations into increasingly isolated small groups that are more vulnerable to predators, um, uh, the competitor species design, uh, disease and catastrophic events, such as storms and fire. Um, Habitat fragmentation, again, uh, keeps them from moving uh, from one place to the next for all of the reasons that they need to do that, which is all listed here. Um, you know, food supplies, finding mates, all of that good, all of that good stuff, maybe nesting areas. Um, and um, then you also have the edge effect, which is something that we had talked about already. Um, the, it is on the edges that you have competition with, with other, um, uh, habitats and so all along the edge is where you are going to go ahead and have uh, competition and the larger something is the more interior you have with respect to exterior the smaller you make it the bigger the edge is um, with respect to the interior area so um, <clears throat> and you can see here that abiotic factors all change there um, and again, this is where uh, you have animals with a very narrow range of tolerance. They have a high edge sensitivity and um, they basically uh, don't like all of the, the variations that are there. Uh, you have to think that generalists do really well on the edges. Um, how does the edge, and we've already talked about the edge effect impact species along that edge. I do highly recommend that you read this paragraph thoroughly. Um, there's a lot of good information in there. Um, define and describe edge sensitivity, which I kind of went over, focusing on organisms with high and low edge sensitivity. So, um, yeah, so this is a really good paragraph for you to go ahead and take in. Um, and I wonder why I stretched on to 243. Oh, okay. Here is why. If you take a look at these pictures here, this gives you an idea of exactly how it is that we are um, destroying and fragmenting uh, habitats. Um, so here you have an Indian tiger, which is endangered, and you can see the red is the stuff that's left. When you have an apex predator like this, uh, they need room to roam to find enough food, and there's uh, some indication that fertility is trigger triggered by uh, the, the, the long walks that they do. Um, it's almost a part of their genetic makeup to go ahead and walk all, um, all the time like that, and so um, these really small areas um, there is some postulating that uh, lowered fertility occurs because they're not able to roam around as much as they could to uh, uh, enhance uh, when they become fertile. Because remember, most animals, unlike humans, are only fertile at one time during the year. You can see here, woof, look at the black rhino. And then you have the African elephant and then the Asian or the Indian elephant as well. So um, you can imagine uh, uh, again, you have all of these metapopulations now that are being uh, segregated from each other. You know, have that gene flow back and forth. Um, remember old terms that we talked about, like the bottleneck effect. If you have a catastrophe happen in one of these small areas, um, the population may bounce back, but they only have all the genetic material of the critters that were in there. And so then you have a, um, a population that, although it may bounce back, may be doomed to go extinct simply because it doesn't have the genetic variety to go ahead and withstand another change. Um, okay, so the next topic is ecological tolerance, which is on page 191. Flip there with me. Let's see. All right, so hopefully all of this is familiar already. Um, define range of tolerance. 
Um, it's right here, the uh, physical and chemical environment under which it can survive. Remember, these are all abiotic factors. This has nothing to do with um, something like predation. Um, what is the impact of a range of tolerance on species survival? Obviously, the larger your range of tolerance, the more places that you can live and the more likely you are to withstand a change within your own environment. So um, if you have a large range of tolerance, you're more likely to survive change. If you have a narrow range of tolerance, um, I should say a broad range of tolerance. If you have a narrow range of tolerance, um, then you have problems. Remember what a range of tolerance looks like on a graph. Um, you can see that um, there really aren't any numbers associated with it, but think about these bands. It can be anything. It can be light, it can be pH, it can be water type, it can be temperature. Um, this represents the number of, you know, like let's say you have it really cold here and really hot here. This is the sweet spot. It's that temperature at which uh, they are the most healthy. Um, uh, uh, when they reproduce, their young uh, have the highest survival rate. Um, so that's what this means here. And it gets too cold. Um, you have uh, populations decline until it's zero. And again, if it gets too warm. Uh, the broader this is, uh, again, uh, with changing uh, temperatures, this thing is more likely to survive. If this is really narrow, it means there is only uh, five or so degrees in which it can survive, and if it shifts one way or the other, done. Not gonna make it. So again, this one says temperature, but it could be any abiotic um, <clears throat> factor that you can think of. So that's all detailed right here. Um, uh, and we talked about broad and narrow. Okay, make note of figure 715, which I already talked about. You know, understand what all the parts mean. Um, some of you guys understand this, I think, in general terms, but listen again to the way that I, you can rewind to go back to listen to the way that I described this. Um, you need to be able to be that comprehensive and that articulate in terms of describing what is going on. Because remember, this is not a high school class. It is, you have to show college level uh, understanding uh, when you do this, uh, when you write about these topics. How does individual range of tolerance differ from species range of tolerance? Remember, as an individual, you have a unique assortment of, of genes. Um, so, I mean, think about in terms of the temperatures that you find comfortable versus what you don't. You know, I'm sure you know somebody who is loves it when it's cold, and you know people like me who loves it when it's hot. Um, so, individually, you know, if, if for some reason our survival was linked to that temperature preference, um, if it got really warm, you know, I would be fine and maybe other people would die off. Um, uh, that genetic difference, remember, is what allows the species to go ahead and survive change. If your entire population only likes it when it's cold, if it gets warm, the entire species or the entire population dies out or the entire species dies out. So, um, again, that genetic variety is very important in order to have a pre-adaptation that's there in the event of an unforeseen change. Remember, you don't adapt in response. You have to have a pre-adaptation in place already for the change that comes. <clears throat> All right, so Natural Disruptions of Ecosystems, page 636 to 638. So clearly this book was published before the course changed, which is why we're jumping all over the place. <clears throat> So this is gonna kind of talk about some things that we haven't really addressed like climate change yet. So just general understanding is really what we're going for here. Um, list the seven natural factors that have influenced climate change in the past. Um, I am not going to read to you, <clears throat> but absolutely know these. These are gonna be important for you to know moving forward because when we start talking about climate change, there's still a lot of people who don't believe it's happening nor believe that humans are influencing the, the pace at which it's occurring. So it is uh, when people point to, well, climate has changed in the past. Yes, absolutely it has. Um, climate has fluctuated on this planet since the planet first cooled. Um, uh, the difference we're gonna find as we move forward is that that change has been accelerated because of human um, influence, <clears throat> which can be problematic. And you know, we'll discuss that in a, in a little bit. Um, this number one is, is interesting to note because this is why we think that the dinosaurs died. We think that an uh, asteroid hit a uh, belt of volcanoes that all went off at the same time, throwing ash into the air that um, 
block the sunlight enough to cool the earth a couple of degrees. Uh, we have recent evidence that this is true because there is a volcano in the Philippines, I want to say in the 70s or 80s, just completely exploded and sent ash into the air, and it did lower the global temperature a measurable amount for about a year. So, and that's just one volcano, so imagine if an entire arc of them went off. It would be um, pretty spectacular. Um, so do be familiar with all of these. Um, it's everything from uh, just solar input, that means how much energy the sun's putting out, um, slight changes in our orbit, um, slight changes in the tilt of the Earth. Oh, by the way, our orbit is not elliptical, it's circular. The reason we have seasons is not because the, the, the Earth is farther or closer to the sun. It has to do with the tilt of the Earth's axis. Um, but that has that tilt has changed a little bit. Um, <clears throat> do you need to know this, that it's called a Milankovitch cycle? Eh, it's, it's not important. If, the, if you were ever asked about this on the national exam, just being able to understand that the, the Earth's axis is tilted, um, its tilt has changed slightly over the, the course of millions of years, you're fine. Um, Air circulation patterns, um, remember ice is reflective, and um, <clears throat> changes in the concentration of greenhouse gases, you don't know what those are yet. Um, the, basically, um, we have gases in our atmosphere that act like um, the, uh, the, <clears throat> the windshield of your car. If you've ever gotten in, a, get, gotten in a car in July here in Florida, you know that it's ridiculously hot inside. It's hotter than it is on the outside, and that's because... Um, sunlight goes through the, um, the windshield, which stands for greenhouse gases, and it, it heats up the air, and uh, although the windshield or the greenhouse gases will allow light through, it traps heat. So um, it's basically like a blanket, um, <clears throat> and um, uh, it keeps the earth warm. But like blankets, one is good, 20 is too many, and that's what's happening. Um, uh, with our output of greenhouse gases. I don't know if you've heard people talk about that before. All right, anyway, and then occasional changes in the ocean currents. All right, so just kind of be familiar with that list. You can see most of them have to do with either the atmosphere or um, ocean or the tilt of the earth and really nothing else. Um, and then reflectivity of ice. Differentiate between glacial and interglacial periods. So right here, Glacial is when stuff gets colder and freezes. Interglacial is when it warms up and it thaws. Woo! Um, what has happened to atmospheric temperature since 1975? This is absolutely significant. And um, it is right here. Um, atmospheric temperatures in most years has been rising. Um, for the past 20 years, I would say with the exception of one year, every successive year is the warmest year on record. So every year we keep breaking the global, um, the global average. Now remember that just because you have a cold day, it doesn't make climate change not a thing. Overall average is what counts. Um, how do ice cores tell us about historic climate trends? This is absolutely something good to know. Um, uh, ice cores trap bubbles of air and they also trap things like uh, pollen and, um, and dust and volcanic ash. And um, understanding how dust and volcanic ash and pollen are connected to temperatures on Earth, and then they can literally withdraw the air that's in those bubbles to determine its composition, and um, therefore determine how, uh, how much uh, of one kind of greenhouse gas was in the atmosphere. It's really fantastic. Um, and they're not small. like. They're, they drill down pretty far and then get these nice big uh, cores of ice. So please make sure that you read this um, and understand how it is that ice cores can tell us about um, climate change in the distant past. Um, ice is a lot like rock in that the farther you go down, the older the ice is. Um, uh, bur buried pollen grains are the same thing. If you find a lot of pollen grains from a plant that can only grow in warm weather, clearly the temperatures were warm there. So um, uh, the, the all pollen looks different under a microscope. Uh, there are people who specialize in this stuff. And so um, they uh, can tell you about, <clears throat> indirectly about the climate based on what kind of pollen they find. Again, just really remarkable. Um, tree rings uh, are another thing that you can look at. The, the more growth that you have, odds are the more water that there was. Um, <clears throat> also, probably uh, warmer. 
So again, they can tell you uh, when things are favorable and when they're not. <clears throat> but you know, again, if it's too warm, then obviously the tree's not gonna grow. It's, it's all based on that kind of tree. So again, you have experts who can tell you based on the thickness of a ring, um, what's going on. Um, coral reefs, same deal. Remember that they uh, grow on top of each other. It's basically like little condos on top of each other. So if you kind of drill down, um, the amount of growth can tell you about the temperature of the water and how much CO2 that there was. So again, you can extrapolate what the, what the atmosphere was like um, during that time. Um, let's see what else we've got. Da -da -da -da. What are three other sources of historic climate change information? You can see right here, um, fossils. Um, you've got plankton and sediment, and then uh, people have been taking temperatures basically since 1861. It used to be something that a lot of people used to do. They keep a little daily journal, and in that daily journal, they wouldn't talk about like, you wouldn't believe what Bob did today. Instead, it is, um, uh, they would list like what the weather is like outside and what the temperature is and the highs and the lows and did it rain. Um, so we have historical records of what the weather was like every single day um, in a lot of regions of the world because of people who kept records because that's just what you did. Um, let's see what else. Describe recent trends in average global surface temperatures. Um, this should scare the bejeebers out of you. Um, you know, it doesn't take much of a, a uh, difference in temperature for, you know, plants in certain areas to stop growing or flowering or bearing fruit. Um, uh, the warmer the air is, the more moisture it can hold, which means the less it rains. Um, and when it does rain, it is pretty catastrophic and causes flooding and landslides and mudslides and things like that. So um, it's, um, like I said, pretty traumatic. 10 warmest years on record since 1861 have taken place since 2005. <clears throat> um, let's see what else. Da -da 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 -da. Uh, climate change on glaciers in general, obviously they're melting, sea ice in particular. Um, again, you can see it's been melting pretty much every single year. Um, uh, something to remember, this won't be on this quiz, but I want for you to internalize this. Melting sea ice does nothing to sea levels. Think about it. When you put ice in a cup and the ice melts, your cup does not overflow because ice is less dense than the water that it's in. So that means that when the ice melts, um, actually your liquid contracts. So what's, what, what ice has to melt in order for sea levels to rise? It has to be ice that's on the land. So sea ice does not, um, melting does not cause sea level rise. Land ice, on the other hand, absolutely does. Um, <clears throat> uh, how has climate change impacted permafrost? Obviously it's melting. Um, um, part of the problem, and it's not mentioned here, is that, uh, ooh, it would help if this was straight, sorry is that permafrost also contains some greenhouse gases that we're gonna talk about that are trapped in it. So as it melts, it's this positive feedback loop, more greenhouse gases, keeps the earth warmer, more melting. Um, and uh, why is this a problem? Because remember where permafrost is, it's in the tundra, and if the tundra is this puddle all the time, there are a lot of organisms that can't live there. Um, the, the, the mosses and whatnot can't grow, and the things that eat those can't grow, you know, can't survive. So, you know, bad. Um, let's see. What two factors cause sea level rise? Oh, sea level rise, nice. Okay, so have to check for spelling errors. Um, let's see right here. Um, expansion of ocean water. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but when water gets warm, it expands a little bit. Uh, those of you who have taken chemistry, this should make sense because as you're going from a solid to a, uh, a liquid to a gas, so you put energy into a system, it's basically forcing molecules apart. That's why it ends up turning into steam when you boil it. Um, so when water warms up, it separates a little bit, so uh, sea levels rise. And then again, melting land-based ice is um, also what causes the issues. Um, which two atmospheric gases are linked to climate change? Uh, you need to know both the names and the formulas. So one of them is CO2, which is carbon dioxide. That is what happens when you exhale. It is also a production of combustion of things like, oh, fossil fuels. Um, and then CH4 is methane gas. It's actually the gas that's produced when you fart. It is that quote unquote swampy smell. 
um, if you've ever been in a swamp or a bog that you smell, um, it is usually the byproduct of um, uh, abiotic decomposition, that means without oxygen. Um, methane also happens to be natural gas, which is also a fossil fuel. So there are pockets of it um, all, you know, all, over, all over the world in places where you also find um, petroleum. All right, um, almost done. And then what has happened to terrestrial and aquatic species as global temperatures rise? Um, there, again, when you have a change, if you can't move or you don't have a pre-adaptation, you die. And so there are a lot of animals that are um, going extinct because of these climate changes. Um, something to think about is uh, uh, the, the water that is running off into the ocean is fresh water, which means if enough of it runs off into and stays in certain parts of the ocean, it means that the salinity um, concentrations change in those areas, which means that the, those organisms that live in those areas most likely will die because they need a certain salinity level in order to survive. So don't just think about um, sea levels rising, think about exactly how that would impact species. So you have lowered salinity. Um, it's gonna change density, which means that the currents may change, um, the way that uh, nutrients cycle through the ocean. Um, uh, also, if the ocean gets deeper, stuff that lives on the bottom that depends on light may not get light anymore because it's too deep now, like coral reefs as an example. If coral reefs are too deep under the water, they're done because they can't get enough sunlight. So you need to not only be able to regurgitate the stuff, you need to be able to think through all the steps as to why it is that sea level rise is going to kill things, especially in the ocean. Um, you can't just go and sea ice melts and then organisms die. Why? You, you need to connect the dots on the national exam. Um, so that is the conclusion of uh, our 2.3 through 2.5 textbook lecture.